You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. So, um, if you remember what I was talking about, uh, all of the different periods that archaeologists have used, now we're going to move into the post-classic period and recognize certain things about this, uh, this uh, uh, experience, the reason why they call it post-classic. When we take a look at the post-classic period, it is benchmarked with two vocabulary words, warfare and imperialism, okay? So let's understand something about warfare and imperialism. And I'm sure that all of you know uh, about warfare and imperialism simply because in our society, you all have grown up with the fact that the United States has been in constant war. In fact, since probably you've been born, the United States doesn't know anything except war. War in Iraq, war in Afghanistan. And warfare is always coupled with a term known as imperialism. And what, what is imperialism? Imperialism, let me just try to give you a, a, a basic explanation of imperialism. Um, it's sort of like the United States going into Iraq or into Afghanistan or into uh, Venezuela today and asking what is our oil doing in your sand or what is our oil doing in your land? That's the nature of imperialism. So when we take a look at imperialism, uh, imperialism and, and warfare, uh, these are the benchmark words to appreciate what is known as the post-classic period. Because war, expanded trade, um, uh, it usually leads to increased and narrow specialization. And what happens is that it results in uh, sharpened, and eco sharpened economic distinctions. You know? uh, basically, a highly militarized society is going to create conflict amongst social classes, is going to create conflict amongst economic classes. Why? Because it will sharpen the distinctions between rich and poor. And most importantly, a highly militarized society favors the male over the female. And this is the significance of warfare. Warfare moves the religious prescriptions over to the male. So a rising warrior military class displaces the priesthood of mathematicians and scientists. And this is what oftentimes occurs. And so the appetite for wealth um, oftentimes leads administrations of centralized state societies to adopt policies of imperialism. Basically, a system is going to rationalize the conquest and economic integration of another system using their religious beliefs, using their cultural attitudes, their cultural biases, to carry out unjustifiable acts. So when societies do take on a male-centered imagination, the religious prescriptions are conveniently balanced in favor of male over female. And the classic example is this one woman named, known as La Malinche or Manincin Nepal, of which I will be covering later, which is the novel that you are going to be reading for this course, Song of the, known as Song of the Hubbingbird. But what militarism does is that it leads to a male-centered imaginative society. And this can be seen in the emphasis on war and the use of sacrifice to keep people living in a constant state of fear. Now, why is fear so important? Because fear can be used by political leaders to create an obedient society, to create an acquiescent population. You're either on our side or you're with the enemy. And so the classic society that we're taking a look at are what are known as the Mechica. And the Mechica society is what we're going to be discussing in this class. Um, <clears throat> you are reading um, uh, Diego, uh, um, oh, oh, because you're reading uh, From Chicanos to Indians, and the author is, is, is giving you the, the importance and understanding of the native past. I'm just trying to give you a more extensive uh, understanding of that past in this course. But the Mechica Tenocha, if we can put Mechica down at the bottom here, I think uh, uh, 
we got it. Um, let's take a look at the Mexica. And we're going to understand uh, this particular society was highly militarized, uh, developed a system of tribute, a system of slavery, a system of sacrifice um, that was a result of the nastiness of war. And um, the notion of imperialism creating interdependencies and in regions. Let's go to the foundation and understand the rise of what the Mexica were. was in Lake Texcoco, the largest of five interconnected lakes covering a valley about 40 by 70 miles. Today, this once vast and open valley is teeming with what is modern-day Mexico City, one of the largest cities in the world. But 700 years ago, the island was so swampy, no one had laid claim to it. Now, as they gazed on the lake, the Aztec leader Tenoch announced to his followers that he had seen an eagle perched on a cactus in the middle of the lake, a sign from the gods that they had found their new home. They would name their city Tenochtitlan. Life is tough for the Aztecs in the early days of Tenochtitlan, but they have a vision, a vision of a powerful city modeled on an ancient and legendary city just 25 miles away. They called this city Teotihuacan, or City of the Gods. We know very little about Teotihuacan because all we have is the archaeological remains. We don't have any writing, we don't have any documentation that, that really fleshes out what went on at this big city. It was in ruins, even in Aztec times, but they believed it to be the stomping grounds of the gods and the literal birthplace of the sun itself. The place the Aztecs most revered in Teotihuacan was a pyramid that rose above the tree line. It was called the Pyramid of the Sun. The massive sun pyramid contains a million cubic yards of earth and stone with a base roughly the same as the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. The Aztecs believe Teotihuacan was laid out in the image of the cosmos created by their gods. Now it was this image they would attempt to replicate in the construction of their new city, Tenochtitlan. Taking on the challenge would be an Aztec leader named Acamapichtli. In 1976, he embarked on an ambitious plan to engineer an advanced city at Tenochtitlan. But there was a problem. The swampy islands that they took over needed a lot of work. When they started to build anything, it would begin to subside. There was simply no foundation on which to build. The Aztec solution would revolutionize the architecture of the Americas began by anchoring their buildings deep in the ground using a system of pilings made from wood. Workers cut stakes into 30-foot lengths, three to four inches wide. These were driven into the soft ground to make a foundation. The pilings were often surrounded with volcanic stone to add strength. Masons and bricklayers could then build walls on top of this base with confidence. They have found wooden pylons to hold the foundations of the of the pyramids the fact that it didn't sink or the fact that it didn't just topple i think that's a major feat of engineering tenochtitlan was an island city but the lakes surrounding it were very shallow sometimes only seven feet deep the whole thing looked like a giant metroplex floating on a pond originally the only way to get from this floating city to the mainland was by boat but the Aztecs eventually devised a series of causeways, sometimes 45 feet wide, that would connect their floating city to the mainland provinces. The causeway was supported by strong wooden pilings, the same pilings that supported their temples and other buildings. Thousands of these pilings had to be driven deep into the lake bed, and this presented a logistical challenge that could only be met by a strong, skilled labor force and the best of Mesoamerica's engineers. To build a causeway, two lines of stakes were laid out. Then the space between them was filled with stones and earth until it reached several feet above the water level. 
This allowed the road to support enormous weight. These causeways were built very straight. Uh, they were very wide with bridges that would open up uh, that connected the city to the north, to the west, and to the south. The roads enabled the Aztecs to transport larger, heavier materials for building. But this presented a new challenge. There were no beasts of burden in Mesoamerica, so everything had to be done with humans. No carts, no wheel. Small loads would be carried on the back with a rope hung from the forehead. Large items like stone blocks or sculptures for a temple would be dragged by huge numbers of men pulling ropes, possibly using logs as rollers. Legend has it one stone bound for a temple required a force of 50,000 men to drag it from the mountains on the mainland, across the causeway, and into the city. The causeways would also present the Aztecs with a new way to get fresh water to Tenochtitlan. In the past, the Aztecs had transported water in canoes from the shore. But a huge boom in the city's population meant they needed a higher tech solution to keep up with demand. They wanted to use water from the springs on the mainland, and so they wanted to build an aqueduct. But the springs were under control of the dominant tribe in the region, the ruthless Tepaniks. The Tepaniks were the... Okay, so let's understand this thing called Mechica. See, Mechica. Um, that's how the people identified themselves as Mexica, not Aztecs. Now, Aztecs is a term that's going to be used by the Spanish to identify the Mexica. They're going to call them by a different name. The Mexica never called themselves Aztecas, the Spanish wolf. And that's only because in their mythology, the Mexica talked about a place where they came from, which was Atzlan, uh, of which the Chicano movement is going to appropriate as a means of connection to the uh, uh, the southwest, but Atzlan is a place up in the north where the Mexica are going to uh, appear and they're going to come down south into Mexico. So let's appreciate something about this thing, uh, uh, this appre let's appreciate something about the varied history that the Mexica are going to leave us. Because the Mexican existence, and you have to understand where does Mexican come from? It, it comes from Mexica. It doesn't, we're not called Aztecan, we're called Mexica. So let's appreciate this Mexican experience in the United States because it has a diverse and varied history that challenges us to seriously understand and come to terms with, especially with regards to the politics surrounding the creation of an immigration policy. This is a policy that affects every Mexican's existence as a human being today. So when we talk about the Mexican experience, first and foremost, we have to root that discussion in native thought practices and beliefs. And so. Now we've come to the point with the rise in the post-classic period of the Mexica identity, of the Mexican identity, because the foundation of the Mexican existence is native traditions. And this is what's so important. This is why we have Chicano studies. These are traditions that are rooted in the land. These are traditions that are rooted in the linguistic expressions that are found today in the area known as the United States Southwest and Northern Mexico. When I talk about the Mogollana, the Hohokam, or the Anasazi, they are rooted in Mexica practices. Mexica practices are also part of the practices of the North. Mexica practices are also a part of the Mississippian. Mexica practices are also a part of Central America and the Mayan experience. Mexica practices are also part of South America. Mexica practices are all up and down the Caribbean. So when we talk about the foundation of the Mexican existence, these are the traditions rooted in the land. These are the linguistic expressions that are found today throughout areas of the Western Hemisphere. So it's in the spirit of the Mexican existence today to recreate native people's expressive mobility. <clears throat> Central Mexico has always been the place that has funneled people north <clears throat> to Canada, south to the Andean mountains, um, or the Andean mountain ranges in South America especially since the rise of the Olmec 5,000 years ago. And that's what we have been trying to establish for ourselves in these particular presentations. When you take a look at that outline that I first shared with you, the very beginning, taking a look at the ancient past 
prior to the arrival of Europeans, prior to the arrival of the other side of the world and this side of the world. This side of the world, there's a lot going on. There's tremendous activity. It took thousands of years to recreate. But central Mexico has always been that place that is funneling people north, that is funneling people south. And today, the reason why Mexicans can be found as workers everywhere in the Western Hemisphere is that they are following these ancient patterns of migration. People traveled from Michoacán to northern Michoacán, which is known as Michigan today. Isite Kansas, you could always stop in Kansas City. Okay. So, the term Mexican, what is it? It's of Nahuatl origin. It comes from Mexica. Mexica means to be human. Mexica refers to our humanity. And this term originated in a place that came to be identified as the center of the universe. And that place was Tenochtitlan. So this film clip helps us appreciate that particular experience. And most importantly, when we talk about the Mexican experience, we have to recognize that it is rooted in a particular society that uh, came to understand uh, warfare, and that came to understand violence. And it was a highly militarized society, as I was sharing with you. Uh, the results were a sharpened distinction uh, between uh, rich and poor. And um, <clears throat> it was a system of tribute, of, of slavery, where slavery existed, where there was sacrifice, which is the result of the nastiness of war. But it was Mexica imperialism that increased interdependencies of the region. A language, Mexica were developing an international language known as Nahuatl. If you could speak Nahuatl, you could uh, communicate with peoples uh, north to Nevada and south to Nicaragua. Um, every foodstuff that f was found in South America and Central America and North America is going to be planted in the gardens of the Mexica. This is how powerful they were. Uh, they had a tremendous uh, monumental architecture, as the film clip revealed. Uh, every act to the Mexica became a religious act. Mm. Warfare in the Mexica was central to their society. They were at war constantly with surrounding societies. We're going to learn the reason why the Spanish are going to be able to take over the Mexica very quickly is because the Mexica had a lot of enemies. Okay? Simply because warfare does that especially with regards to displacing uh, societies. Now, <clears throat> the militarism uh, that leads to male-centered imaginative society can be a scene in the emphasis on war and the use of sacrifice. So with an emphasis on war, systems of tribute become important. Um, the sharpened economic distinctions. Well, this is where a term called kalpuli is very important. Uh, the kalpuli... Um, it's very important because that's the basic economic unit. So each calpuli was responsible for the maintenance of gardens. And the maintenance of gardens is key here because the Mexica developed a system of, 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 um, of gardens that are known as the chinampas. Okay? So you'll see these two words, Nahuatl, Nahuatl being the, the international language, and then the chinampa system. A chinampa system that was used for the maintenance of gardens. Now, one of the things that's most important with regards to warfare in any civilization as a result of warfare is slavery. Uh, we're used for the construction and the maintenance of irrigation systems and monumental architecture. So the formation and control of labor forces is very important whenever you create monumental architecture, whenever you create a state centralized society. You have those labor forces that are primarily responsible for service to the state and then, of course, there are those that are used for personal service. Nonetheless, with regards to labor contracts, uh, there's, the discussion, there's always a discussion of specific rights that are codified or made legal. And in this particular case, our textbook uh, helps us understand um, the, the importance of Vigil's textbook from Indians to Chicanos, that first two chapters, help us appreciate something about the foundation of the Chicano identity. So the Mexica were developing an international language. There was a trade of goods, an exchange of goods throughout the hemisphere with the Caribbean. Um, Nevada, Nicaragua, South America, Central America were trading 
uh, and, and everything was being funneled through Mexico. So again, the people in, in the Mexica were, were extremely self-centered. Uh, they were very conceited. Uh, every act to them was a religious act. But warfare always creates diplomacy and trade. But most importantly, when we talk about the Mexican experience, we have to appreciate that it forms the basis of the experiences of people today from the Caribbean, from Central America, from South America, who are living in the United States today. See, what happens to the Mexican in terms of migration and immigration and the formation of labor forces eventually happens to everyone else yeah, with some modifications. Now, one of the most important things about why Mexicans are in every state of the Union in the United States is their irrigation and agricultural expertise. Because the key to any civilization, as we're going to see in the film clip, is water control and food production. So let's appreciate, and we're going to go back to this documentary, let's appreciate this rich heritage that Americans take for granted as they happily shop for fresh produce at their local grocery store. The Chinampa system is the basis for the Mexican identity. That's why one of the things that you will always see in the Mexican identity are these gardens. They always have gardens in their backyards and they're growing basic foodstuffs. And that's the Mexican experience. And that's one of the reasons why Mexicans today in the United States are the farm workers for Americans, because Americans are not being trained to go out and pick food. They just don't do it. So let's take a look at this rich heritage. After conquering the Valley of Mexico, the Aztecs could now turn their attention to bringing clean water to their growing city. Remarkably, the Aztecs would independently design and build something that only a few world empires would master, the aqueduct. The aqueduct actually had two channels, each about five feet high and three feet wide. One would be cleaned and maintained, while the other was being used so the water flow was never interrupted. The twin tube aqueduct ran for three miles from the mainland to the center of the island city. In town, water streamed into public fountains and reservoirs, and was distributed to the public in large clay jars or by canoe. In comparison to the Europeans, the Aztec were a very clean people. We know that the Aztec emperor bathed twice a day. So in terms of hygiene, the Aztec people uh, was much more advanced than the Europeans. While the Aztec nobles were bathing in luxury, at this time in Europe, plague caused by unsanitary conditions was killing millions. King Nezahualcoyotl's own bath was one of the most unique in the Americas. It was fed by a sophisticated aqueduct system that also brought running water to his palace grounds. Behind me is the hill of Tezcatzinco. And on this hill, Nezahualcoyotl built a fantastic pleasure palace. And around this palace, a virtual botanical garden filled with all of the exotic flowers of Mesoamerica. Nezahualcoyotl brought water from the Sierra Nevada mountains all the way down to here, into this hill, to his palace, just to water his plants. To install an aqueduct there, Nezahualcoyotl had to fill a huge gorge between Tezcocinco and the next hill. As the water arrived at the first hill, it gathered in small pools built to control the speed of the flow before it reached the aqueduct. After crossing the aqueduct, the water ran in a circuit around Tezcocinco Hill, spilling off over the sides in rock-cut waterfalls to water the gardens. It ended up in a nearly perfectly round rock-cut pool called the King's Bath. And from here, he could look upon his domain at Texcoco, and he could look down at the botanical gardens that he was watering with his fantastic aqueducts. It is indeed a bath fit for a king. By the mid-15th century, with their empire on the rise, it was time for the Aztecs to choose a sovereign leader. He was called Moctezuma, and he would be the first of two emperors with this now famous name. Moctezuma's first order of business was to extend the empire's borders. The Aztecs captured city-states 
southward to the Valley of Oaxaca, westward to the Pacific, and east toward the Gulf of Mexico. By 1449, the empire contained as many as 15 million people. In the short span of 100 years, the Aztecs accomplished the impossible. They had toppled the Mesoamerican world order. But while the Aztecs dominated militarily, their island city was vulnerable to a different kind of enemy. Like New Orleans, Tenochtitlan was constantly doing battle with water. And one of Moctezuma's first projects was to protect his city from the deluge of water surrounding it. This is what is left of Lake Xochimilco, the southern part of Mexico City in Aztec times, the city of Tenochtitlan. This lake, like the other four lakes that surrounded the city, were spring-fed. Thus, there were no rivers or streams into which it could drain. And if it rained hard enough, the water would rise up and sweep over the land and into the city itself. And this is exactly what happened in the mid-1400s when a flood of catastrophic proportions swept into Tenochtitlan. The city and the empire it commanded were almost completely destroyed, and the Aztec civilization had to once again rely upon the genius of its engineers, and one engineer in particular. Montezuma enlisted the help of his old ally, Netzwalcoyotl, to protect the city he was rebuilding from the lake. Netzwalcoyotl would design a solution that would make him the greatest engineer on the continent. His plan was to create a safe zone around the city with a huge dike that would protect Tenochtitlan and its inhabitants. It was designed to be larger than any earthwork anywhere in the Americas at the time, running for 10 miles just east of the city from the southern edge of the lake across to the north. The walls were a wickerwork construction made of sticks, reeds, stone, and earth. Since the lake was shallow, the dike was only about 12 feet in height, but some 27 feet wide. Netzwalcoyotl fitted the dike with sluice gates, most likely wooden doors that would be raised or lowered to control the water level behind it. The dike also served another purpose. It protected their water supply. It was important to build some sort of protective mechanism to keep salt water out of the freshwater western part of the lake. An army marches on its stomach, so said Napoleon. Now an ample food supply for civilians is a no-brainer in the critical development of any civilization. But the Aztecs perfected a unique method, not only to provide a substantial food supply for its civilian populace, but to fuel the military expansion of its empire. This revolutionary engineering was called Chinampas, a system that allowed them to literally create new land to farm and to live on. If you're going to have a city of any size, you have to provide room for them. And so what they did was build up these Chinampas in the lake bed. Basically, Chinampa is an artificial island built in the lake. They look like narrow football fields, about 300 feet long by about 30 feet wide. A chinampa was built by weaving a web of sticks floating in the water and piling reeds on top of them. Mud was then scraped from the lake bottom and piled atop the reeds to form the chinampa. It took four to six men eight days to build the average chinampa. They were connected to the city by massive navigational canals that would take thousands of men months to build. A chinampa like this one could produce up to seven crops a year, whereas a farm on the mainland could yield one, maybe two, maybe three at the most. As a crop was ready to harvest on a chinampa, seedlings from another would be sprouting out of mud that would be spread on a boat adjacent to the chinampa. Then when the seedlings were ready, they'd be transported to Chinampa, and this cycle would be repeated over and over and over again on hundreds and then thousands of Chinampas. Now, it was this technology that transformed Tenochtitlan from just another tribal town in the 14th century to a dominant and thriving city-state. All right, so again, um, let's appreciate all of the different presentations that come to this to take us to the post-classic.
And the post-classic is very important because this is where um, the arrival of Columbus and the arrival of the other side of the world uh, is going to occur at this time. So what's important to appreciate is that there is a rich history prior to the arrival of Columbus. The only thing is, is that it's not called history, it's called anthropology. Because native peoples don't have a history until Europe comes and creates the history for them. Um, so if you want to learn, uh, if you take a his U.S. history class or if you want to take a history class anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, it always starts with Columbus. Because if you want to know anything before Columbus, then you take anthropology because it relies on archaeology. So, let's understand something about the Western Hemisphere. It is connected. It is interconnected. You are reading um, the material that's most important that will help us appreciate this interconnection. North and South America are interconnected through Central America and the Caribbean Islands. It is not an isolated experience. North and south go through the center of the world, and that's Tenochtitlan. And Tenochtitlan, this is one of the reasons why Mexicans are everywhere today. Now, it just didn't happen overnight, as you can tell by this class, by this course. Here we are in our fourth session, or whatever, oh, I mean, all the different sessions. It took ages to reach this level of complexity. Ages. We have looked at those, and we have periodized the past, we have come to understand the pre-class, uh, the, 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 uh, all of the different periods. Everyone became part of a universal experience. So we as Chicanos, we as native peoples, we are called upon to recover and reclaim our ancestral heritage. And this, this cannot be denied us. And this is why we have Chicano Studies classes. Regardless of whatever comes out of Fox News and their fear about the Mexican taking over, or whatever comes out of Trump's administration and wanting to build a wall, we are here. We're not leaving. These are our lands. These are our experiences. It doesn't matter what it is that they think. We're here. Okay, so this ends this particular segment.